You may be seated. So good to see you today. I want to ask you a question. If you think about it, it's really a question we have to deal with. In this world of discouragement, disappointment, setbacks, heartaches, all kinds of challenges we all have to face, do you ever wonder, down deep in your heart, how am I going to stay faithful and optimistic in a discouraging and hateful world? Well, how many of you know sometimes you just got to keep looking up when this world is trying to bring you down? Tom Tor Toro is a guy who can explain a little bit of that for you. He was a valedictorian in his high school, got into Yale for his undergraduate, and uh, did super well. While he was at Yale, he decided he wanted to be a filmmaker, so he was accepted into NYU's graduate school of filmmaking. And he was just on a trajectory of success, but midway through his graduate school studies, he realized that was not for him. He didn't want to be a filmmaker. So after all these years of achievement, success, accomplishment, he dropped out of grad school, went back home, was living with his mom and dad, didn't know what he wanted to do, and uh, got discouraged, fell into depression, and really had no direction whatsoever. Well, one day he was at a used bookstore in town, just kind of bumming around, and he found a box of old copies of New Yorker magazine. Now, if you know anything about the New Yorker magazine, they have world-class cartoons. That's one of the things they're known for. And Tom was looking at those cartoons, and he thought to himself, you know, I used to draw, and I loved it. I could do this. So he went home, and he started drawing cartoons. And when he got one that he thought was just right, he submitted it to the New Yorker magazine. And within no time, he got a rejection letter from New Yorker. And he said, you know, they were so nice about it, you felt really good about it, even though they were really telling you to forget about it. Well, he just kept on, and uh, he kept drawing cartoons, and in spite of multiple rejection letters, he didn't give up hope that someday he'd be a cartoonist for New Yorker. After 609 rejections, on the 610th submission, he got an email that he had sold a cartoon to New Yorker magazine. Today, Tom Toro is known as one of the elite cartoonists for the New Yorker magazine, has submitted and had published over 200 cartoons in the New Yorker. His career is set. Now he publishes cartoons all over the place, has books and cartoon, uh, uh, you know, books of cartoons out that he sold. He's a bestseller. All because of what? He kept looking up when the world was trying to bring him down. Do you know that in the Christian life, the same principle applies? You've got to keep looking up, even though, even though this world will try to bring you down. That's what we want to look at this morning as we look at the subject, why we keep looking up. Would you open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3? Colossians chapter 3. We started in verse 1 last week. We're going to read it again just as a recap, but we really want to zero in on verses 3 and 4 today. But let's read Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. What do you call that? Look up. Keep looking up. Seek the things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above. Keep looking up not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now, when we talk about looking up as we are today, we're not talking about some kind of positive thinking mental trick. We're not talking about looking up for a better job or a pay raise or to make sure your kids get straight A's and get on the dean's list, which, by the way, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But when we come here and we're talking about what the Bible says about looking up, we're talking about looking up to heaven to see and get a glimpse and a constant perpetual gaze at the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I like the way Alan Redpath, that 20th century Bible teacher, said it when he said, let's keep our chins up and our knees down. We're on the victory side. Now, the Colossians, as we know, they were being discouraged. They were being harassed by false teachers, and they were being tempted, and uh, they were trying to get them to get their eyes off Jesus and go down a pathway which would have ruined their Christian life. And Paul was challenging them to look above the things of this world and look to the things of God. In verses 1 and 2, which we looked at last week, it was an invitation to take our eyes off of this world and focus our attention on Christ at the right hand of God. Because verse 1 says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Listen, the reason some of us as Christians live in a perpetual state of discouragement is that we have forgotten This old truth, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. This world is only temporarily an assignment, and I am really a citizen of heaven marooned on earth, not a citizen of earth on my way to heaven. And the way I'm supposed to live my life is to keep my eyes fixed upon the Lord, to have an upward mindset, an elevated perspective, and to keep my eyes fixed on the things of God. Then, verses 3 and 4, which we want to look at today, explain the rationale. In other words, why should I keep my eyes fixed upon God? Why should I look up? Well, verses 3 and 4 tell us. In fact, the first word of verse 4 makes it clear that verses 3 and 4 are explanatory words. Let's look at it. The first word is for. Verses 1 and 2 say, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes fixed on heaven. For, in other words, because, for this reason. Here's the justification for always having that upward look. For you've died. And you said, whoa, 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 whoa. That's my justification. I'm dead. Preacher, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you think being dead is good news, you're going to have to explain that to me. Well, I'm going to. The best news you ever heard as a Christian is, you're dead. You say, this is not making any sense to me whatsoever. Well, let me ask you a different way. How many of you remember a time when you were not saved? How many of you remember that when you were not saved, there were things in your life that were uh, very powerful uh, uh, allurements and attractions and temptations to you? that after you got saved, you suddenly got freedom from those things. I could go back through my testimony. I won't bore you with all the details. But there were things in my life before I started walking with God that I didn't think I was ever going to quit. Bad habits, things that I knew I shouldn't be doing, things that I would try real hard, I'm going to quit. I'd go to bed at night, make myself promises, tomorrow's going to be different. The next day, I'd go right back to the same things all over again. But when I came to the Lord, I realized after I came to the Lord that I looked at some of the things that used to hold me prisoner, and then I would say to myself, you know, I'm not attracted to those things anymore. I can say goodbye to those things. That's why we sing this song, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Hey, listen, are we telling the truth when we sing that, or is that just lip service? Are we really free? I'm telling you, when you get right with God, you're free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, you are free at last. And Paul is saying the reason that you and I are free is that the things that used to look like life to you now look like death. You look at it now and say, I have no attraction to that. I have no desire for that. I am free from all of that. I am dead to it. I am no longer attracted to the things that used to seem so attractive to me. So Paul said the basis of all the benefits that we have in the Christian life is this. I'm dead to all this. You say, Pastor, that's the weirdest thing you've ever said. No, it's biblical teaching. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, deny himself, and take up his what? Cross. Now, he didn't say take up my pillow, right? 
He didn't say take up a Twinkie. He said take up what? A cross, the instrument of death in the first century world. The cruelest ideology that the world ever came up with was nailing a man to the cross. And Jesus said, come on, child of God. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you better be ready to take up not a life of comfort, not a life of compromise, but a life of the cross. Be ready to die to the things of this world. Live a life of self-discipline and self-denial. Remember what you say, but here's the thing, preacher. Yes, when I got set free, I had a time in my life where I wasn't attracted to all that stuff. But slowly but surely, I started looking back going, well, it wasn't that bad. And every now and then, now I'm going to talk to you. Every now and then, even though I know I shouldn't, I look both ways and I think, well, maybe a little bit wouldn't hurt me. I'm talking to the person right next to you. You better believe it. <laughs> that person sitting next to you knows what I'm talking about. You think to yourself, I know I shouldn't. The Bible says I shouldn't. The preacher said I shouldn't. The people at church said I shouldn't. But they're not here. And just a little won't hurt me. And so I sneak back over there, and guess what? It hurts. And then I regret it. And then I come back and say, Lord God, I can't believe that this is me. After you set me free and I tasted salvation and the blessing of God. And now I'm back here with this trash that I once gave up. You say, preacher, that person sitting next to me is under some heavy conviction now. So what am I supposed to do? Because every now and then, I feel like I'm going good for God. Man, I've been going to church, been reading my Bible, been fasting and praying. But every now and then, that old attraction comes rearing its head. And I feel so tempted. You say, I thought I was dead. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15? Paul, I die daily. Amen? In other words, yeah, I've given myself a funeral. I said goodbye to my old way of life, but there is this thing inside me. There's this nature inside me that still every now and then feels like it's being drawn like a magnet back to things that I know are wrong that are inconsistent with my testimony, that are going to do nothing but hurt me. And Paul said, i got to wake up every day and say, I can't, come on, I can't live on yesterday's blessing any more than the Israelites could live on yesterday's manna. i got to die today to the things that seem so attractive to me. Remember what Paul said? I am crucified with Christ. So we don't need to be surprised when Paul says here, man, I hear a lot of crickets instead of amens today. We don't need to be surprised today that Paul said the basis of all of our blessings is the fact that we have died to the elemental things of this world and we are now alive to a new attraction and that is a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are those blessings that we're attracted to? Well, that's exactly what I want us to notice this morning. Two things I want you to notice. Number one, we're going to hurry. We keep looking up because we live a hidden life. We live a hidden life. Now, of all the things that you expected me to say, this is probably the last on the list, but this is what the Bible says. Look at verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Can I share with you that this is probably the most unusual benefit of the Christian life? It's the one we hear the least about. When's the last time you heard a sermon about being hidden with Christ? You say, well, I can't remember the last time. Well, you're hearing one today. But it is an unusual benefit. It's one you don't expect. You say, well, if I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. If I'm saved, I know my sins are forgiven. If I'm saved, I know I got Christian brothers and sisters. I've got a Bible that tells me the truth and a spirit that'll fill me and gifts from the Lord that'll help me be useful in the kingdom. But what is this benefit that I'm hidden with Christ in God? It is an unusual benefit because it is the, come on, it's the only place in the New Testament where we're promised this. 
Nowhere else is it explicitly stated that we're hidden with Christ in God. So you say, well, I don't even know what it means. Well, first of all, I want you to notice two things. We're hidden in secrecy. We're hidden in secrecy. Because look at verse 3 again. The Bible says we're hidden with Christ in God. Now, check this out. Remember the context, the attraction to the lost things, the things of the earth. And now the benefit, is anybody with me today? The benefit to you and me is in spite of all of the attractiveness of the things that used to hold me in slavery to sin, I am now hidden with Christ in God. And we are hidden in secrecy because the word hidden itself is the Greek word, are you ready? Crypto. We got a word cryptic. The word means to be sequestered, to be hidden, to be secreted away. You say, I, I'm not with you. I'm not tracking with you. What does it mean? Well, let, let me ask you this. Have you got any lost people in your life? I mean, people that are just lost. I mean, family members, co-workers. You don't have to raise your hand because I know the answer. Of course you do. How many of them, they know you're a Christian? but it isn't swaying them. Let's talk. You're, they're not being convinced by you that it's the better way of life. Now, you know it's a better way of life. You, 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 you know that being a Christian is better than being lost. But when they look at you, they're not drawn to your new way of life. You say, oh, yes, they are. Then where are they? Don't buy the bill of goods that if you'll be real nice, people are going to flock to Jesus. Nobody's saved by your life. Everybody's saved by his death. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean you can live like the devil. That won't convince them. Are you with me at all? The reason, this is biblical teaching, the reason they don't see the difference in you is because they don't see Jesus. As far as the 1.9 million of the 2 million people in our city who do not care what you believe, are you with me? The reason that they do not see anything in you is because they have zero awareness of him. Crickets instead of amens. I must be over the target area. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back to the Father and seated himself at the right hand of God, as far as the lost world was concerned, if he ever existed at all, he's gone now and we'll never see him again, and he is an irrelevancy to the average person in this world. But to you and me, he's not invisible. To you and me, he's not hidden. In fact, according to verses 1 and 2, we see him every day, amen? We're looking at him. We're talking to him. We're conversing with him. We're communing with him. But the rest of the world is going on business as usual as if Jesus didn't exist. Because check this out. Jesus is hidden from this world. And you are hidden with him. Because wherever he is, you are. Watch this. In 1922, archaeologists discovered in the Valley of the Kings the tomb of King Tut, the 19-year-old boy pharaoh. Nobody knows for sure why he died. Somebody said it was the vice pharaoh that knocked him in the head. We don't know for sure. But they discovered King Tut's tomb. Do you know why you know more about King Tut than any other pharaoh? because his tomb had never been discovered in 3,200 years. And when it was discovered, it had never been robbed by grave robbers or tomb robbers. And therefore, all of his stuff, all the wealth, all of the gold, all of the regal clothing, everything was still in the tomb exactly as they had shut it up 3,200 years ago. And that made it one of the greatest discoveries of Egyptology. Inside the tomb were found a hundred shabti. You say, the what? The shabti. A shabti is a little figurine about that big, shaped like a mummy, 
and they wear all these different clothing, and you can identify by the type of shabti that they are exactly what their role was. You say, I don't even know what you're talking about. These little dolls were found, these little figurines, and the figurines were shaped like servants of the Pharaoh. They found in there uh, figurines of tiny soldiers, tiny uh, bakers, cooks, farmers, even beer makers, fishermen, and boat handlers. Why? Here's why. Because, are you still with me? Because the Pharaoh believed that when he died and he would go into the afterlife, he'd still be the Pharaoh, and he wasn't going to fish. He wasn't going to dig holes to plant seeds in the ground. He wasn't going to go out and make a bed or uh, pull down the shades when it was sunny outside. He had to have servants for that. So they made these little figurines of all of his servants and put these symbolic shabti, these figurines, in his tomb, believing that when the Pharaoh came back to life, all the little servants were going to come to life and serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. You say, that's weird. Well, that's what they believed. Because their belief was where the king is... <laughs> you'll find the servants. Can I help you understand something? This world ridicules you, mocks you, doesn't understand you because they ridicule and mock and don't understand him. But here's what you know. It's a little family secret. Where the king is, the servant is sure to be as well. You are hidden in Christ. Well, let me show you something else. Not only are you hidden in secrecy, you're hidden in safety. You're hidden in safety. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at verse 3 again. The Bible says that we're dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Can I ask you a question? Can you think of a safer place for your spiritual life? Amen? Can you think of a safer place for your Christian life than to be hidden with Christ in God? It's like a double lock. You're in Christ with God, with Christ in God. I'm going to tell you something. Even the devils in hell can't get to you because you're safe. You're secure. You're locked in. There's not a chance that you're going to be grave robbed. There's not a chance that you're going to be brought down because you are with Christ in God. Do you know that this benefit of being hidden with Christ is a benefit that even though it's not mentioned anywhere else, it is sure good news when you finally hear about it, that I'm safe. I'm secure. He's the best security system you've ever heard about. He's the very best. How many of you remember that old song we used to sing at church? I mean, things change. We don't sing the same songs we always used to sing. But how many of you used to sing that old song? Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Well, that was the most popular song in the hymnal for almost 200 years. Rock of ages, that's Jesus. Cleft, a cleft is a broken place. It's a place where separation has occurred. And that means he died on the cross. He was broken on the cross. Rock of ages, broken for me, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let me find security and shelter. Do you know where that song came from? In 1763, Augustus Top Lady, who was a... Anglican minister was walking through the hills near his home in England when a, suddenly a storm came up and started pouring down torrential rain. He was right next to a gorge, and in that gorge, this big rock formation, there was a cleft, not a cave, just a place where he could scoot in out of the rain. So this Anglican minister got up in this cleft in the rock and started hiding, sheltering himself from the storm. And as he was hiding himself in the the cleft of the rock, the words to that poem came to his mind, and he literally scribbled, according to the legend, there's a plaque on the rock still there today, uh, attesting to this fact, according to the legend of the writing of the song, while he was in that place inside the rock seeking shelter, the words to that song came to him, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Became one of the most popular songs for the last 200 and plus years. Can I share some good news with you? It's not just a song, amen. It's all true. 
that our great Savior has found a hiding place for you and me, near to the heart of God. As near, listen, you're as near to God as you can possibly be. When the world throws its worst at you, God provides his best for you. When you feel disenfranchised and, and like an outlier in this world, our Lord says, don't worry. You've got a place of safety, security. I'll give you shelter from the storm because our our Lord has provided for you a place of safety and security in Him. Just keep looking up. But I got one more thing, and it won't take but a minute. Not only do we have a hidden life, <laughs> we can look up because we've got a hopeful life. Look at verse 4. The Bible says, when Christ, who is your life, appears. By the way, remember what new what the New Testament teaches. Eternal life, though it lasts forever, is not really measured in longevity. That's not really the only measurement. I mean, for instance, come on, think about it. If you are suffering every day with pain and you live eternally with that pain, who wants that? If you're brokenhearted and sad and discouraged and disappointed, disappointed and somebody told you, well, you're going to live like this forever and ever and ever, you'd be like, give me a break. Where's the exit ramp? Get me out of here. But eternal life is not just in how long it lasts. Eternal life is in a person, not on a calendar. And now it does last forever. But look, when Jesus who is your life, appears. Then you will also appear with him <laughs> in glory. You know, for 2,000 years, the church has been looking for one event. You say, yeah, get my kids through college. No, 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 that's a whole different thing. For the last 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has been looking for the return of Jesus Christ. I like what Billy Graham, the late great Billy Graham said not too long ago. He said that the hope, there is a hope that Christ is coming soon. And this is is what is called in Scripture the blessed hope. Now, did you notice in verse 4? The verse 4 is a complete contrast to verse 3. I mean, look, in verse 3, you're hidden. In verse 4, you appear. In verse 3, you're dead. In verse 4, you are alive. The word appear here is in absolute contrast to the word hidden. The word hidden, crypto, cryptic, hidden away, secured, sequestered, secretive. No, no, that isn't how we end up. That's how we are now. That's not where we're ending up. Verse 4 says, when he appears, that's the Greek word phos. There are hundreds of words in the English, New Te English language that start with the prefix pho, like photograph, light writing, phosphorus, a light substance. Because pho means light. And the word for appear here is the word which at its root word means to bring a thing to light. In other words, all your friends and all your family members who look at you and wonder, why do you go to church? Why do you read the Bible? Why do you pray? Why do you fast? Why do you tithe? Why do you share the faith? Why do you live a disciplined life? That's hidden now. But one of these days, all the lights are going to shine. And one of these days, everything you're doing now is going to be manifested when He comes again, when He appears. And the Bible says when He appears and brings light to Himself, you will also appear with Him in glory. Doxa. It's all going to be made manifest. That which is hidden now is going to be plain sight in that day. It's all going to look a lot different. He said, well, pastor, that's all good, but I'm tired of waiting. You don't know how bad I got it down here. Man, my kids are a mess. My wife and I are having trouble. My 
I don't think I'm ever going to get that house paid off. The boss is giving me all kinds of grief. Or you're saying my employees just aren't what they used to be. Besides that, I hurt. I got to take all kinds of meds. And I'm sick of this world and its condition. And I don't think it's ever going to get better. And all you tell me is don't worry, someday it'll get better. I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> I understand. But we're closer than we've ever been before. You know, a couple years ago, I was invited to go preach in Oklahoma at a big conference. And the weather was bad, so the flights got delayed. I don't know how many layovers. I had a couple. I for sure had to go to Dallas, and it got delayed, and the weather was bad, and I just never could get off the ground. So I was supposed to get there early in the evening, and I'd already planned, well, I won't eat. I'll wait till I get to, I'll wait till I get where I'm going, and I'll just eat near the hotel. Well, it was like midnight before I finally got there because of all the flight delays. So I got the uh, rental car, GPS, started driving, and I'm like, I'm like, praise God, where in the world am I? I mean, I'm supposed to be at a big conference, and I'm out in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma. It's dark. I don't really know my way around. I find the hotel where I'm supposed to go, still a couple miles out of town. I was hungry. By the time I got checked in, it was about 1230 at night. And I said to the guy behind the desk, uh, where could I eat? He said, well, there's a McDonald's, a Wendy's, a Arby's right down here. I said, man, you're talking my language. He said, just get on the access road, stay on the access road, and you'll be right where you need to be. So I headed on down there and... Uh, Eight in the car, feeling good. It's about quarter to one in the morning. I'm ready to go back, get in the hotel, get checked in, get to sleep, go, go preach the next day. Well, what he didn't tell me is that I was on the access road, but the highway was a toll road. And I had to go out on the access road because the hotel was behind me. Had to drive down the access road, go over, go into the Odin Pass, get on the interstate and come back. But the interstate was a toll road. So I'm out in the middle of nowhere, quarter to one in the morning, headed back to the hotel. It's only about an exit up the road. And I come to the tolls. But they weren't like the tolls where you're on Mopac and you just keep on going. You had to actually go into a gate like at the airport. And there's nobody out there. I felt like I was the only person in Oklahoma right then. There wasn't a soul. They weren't manned. They were all automated. Now check this out. I'm not making this up. I drive up. I'm in a rental car. I drive up. And here's the sign, 35 cents, correct change only. I said, correct change only? I haven't even had change in my pocket in 20 years. What are you talking about, correct change? So I'm looking around like, do you take plastic? I mean, what? Is there somebody you can call? Is there? So what are you going to do? The only thing you can do. Keep going. <laughs> what else can you do? I wasn't going to spend the night there. So I thought, well, you know, that I felt a flash bulb hit when I drove through. So I said, well, they'll find me. I guess. So when I checked back into the, uh, to the airport a couple days later, I thought, well, maybe when I check my car back in, there will be a fee. No. I thought, well, when I get my credit card bill, maybe there will be a toll road fee. Well, a couple weeks passed, I got my credit card bill. No fee. And I started thinking, well, maybe I'm good to go. <laughs> Another month passed, no fee. And then I got my bill, $3.50. Thirty-five cents for the toll, and the rest of it, just because they could. <laughs> and it occurred to me, this is why they want exact change, because I'm not the only one that gets stuck in there without exact change. But for a while there, I thought, <laughs> they're not going to get me. But they got me. 
the Oklahoma DOT is not going to let you go with their 35 cents. If the Oklahoma DOT can chase down my rental car and find my credit card bill, even though it didn't come right away, it did come. Don't you think that Almighty God has his eye on you and he knows exactly when he's going to come and even though you're tired of waiting, don't give up. He's coming. He's coming. Keep looking up because Jesus is coming. Let's all stand all over this place.